So hello, and we're really lucky today because we have Alan O'Brien, who's better known as Gorilla with a Brush. And I think Hi. I think he's one of the best painters that's on YouTube, although you mainly work on Twitch, really. It's just your YouTube, uh, you stream your thing to YouTube, right? Yeah. Although uh, we've got, I'm going to have some videos coming up. Um, a buddy of mine who's a video editor, um, he lives in Nebraska, and he came out and spent some time with me over this last week actually and we filmed videos i did one of the atlantis miniatures models from start to finish and he filmed everything um we're going to actually be putting together some videos for atlantis miniatures so they can use them as you know kind of for their customers or put them on their website or something like that those might also go on my channel we'll see then we did some videos on brush care color theory paint consistency how to paint wood textures um, cloth textures i did a freehand banner um, that he recorded. So we're going to actually have some some really high quality, high def tutorial videos that will start going up on my channel uh, whenever he gets a chance to finish editing them. Awesome, because I, a lot of your stuff is like, it's really, really good. That's that's the thing that, I can't remember which is the first one I saw of yours, but first thing I remember was like, damn. And uh, my, my wife was looking at some of your stuff the other day just because I said, oh yeah, we're going to do the interview sort of thing. So she wanted to look and she, she was like, He's better than you. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I like her. <laughs> but I think she looked at the, uh, Brutally honest. the dwarf that you just did with the tartan. Okay. And she yeah. was like, yeah. that was really impressive. And, and that's the yeah. thing. It's, uh, I think it's good. Like my stuff is, is very much uh, tabletop quality. That's where I aim at. That's where I work uh, most of the time. So I think it's really cool to uh, have inspiration and find those, those other painters who do things different because I think with a lot of beginners it's they're not always getting it wrong because they don't have any talent there's just sometimes I see them do stuff it's like you're just doing it wrong the wrong technique right. the wrong paint or the wrong uh, mixing fluids or you know that they've seen something oh, I can use this or they've seen someone who's really good who has used a certain solution or something for years knows how it completely works try to copy it they don't do it the same way it comes out glunky or whatever they don't understand why so I think it's, it's always good to have different different people. And you explain stuff, which I like, because oh, there is some people who are really good, but they never explain anything. Right. And one thing and, I like with your streams is that you always explain. And if someone says, why is that blue when you mix these two colors, <laughs> you explain it. You don't just go, yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, my, my thing, you know... I wasn't always this good of a painter. Um, I can send you a picture you can you know, put up for this broadcast if you want of the first models I painted. Like, I didn't even know you know what primer was. I, I was painting Hero Quest models essentially were some of the earliest things I painted. And you could see my Hero Quest models, like they still had red faces because the, <laughs> the models were red. Yeah. I didn't even have flesh colored paint. Um, I tried to paint a, a white beard on the dwarf, but I didn't have any primer down, so it's just, and I was using testers enamel paints, which are, <laughs> you know, and so, you know, it's just, it looks like I just kind of whitewashed a red beard, essentially, and they're just really, really terrible. So, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing at the beginning either, but, you know, when I was going through my learning process, there were people who would give me tips and would help me, um, you know, local people at the store would, would just kind of pull me aside and say, you know, you, you really could thin your paints more, you're going to get this, and just just help me along the way. And I, I always like to try to try to pay that forward. You know, I mean, I, I'm not like protective of any of my techniques or any of my color recipes if people want to try them, because, you know, I know that just giving you some advice, it might help you get better, but you're not going to instantly become like, you know, the fan, the greatest painter, you just have to practice. Yeah. So here's some things to practice, go practice them, get better, take pride in what you're doing. Um, welcome to the hobby kind of thing. It's, it's, um, I try to be you know, I try to pay it forward, try to be welcoming and, and build, you know, the community of people that, that are fun to be around, that are producing cool stuff, that are helping each other. That's just kind of my, my thing. I think that helps everyone. Like I used to do some of the military shows here and you'd see some of these amazing, like kits built. But a lot mm -hmm. of those guys, if you said, how did you do this? Or how'd you do that? They, they wouldn't say. And the thing that I always noticed though, was the following year, that kit that might've been really good. Someone's done something better. And yeah. I always, I took that to heart because I'm like, I can be really protective of, you know, you can sit there and I, I know how to, I've worked out how to do something and that's real, but guaranteed there's going to be someone better than me 
or, or you right. know, and then there'd be someone better than there's him. always somebody better. So, there's exactly. always somebody better. Exactly. Yeah. So I think if with that being the case, there's no point me being arrogant or protective about how I did something because there's always someone better. So I might as well, if I know suddenly someone says, why did you do it this way? Or how did you do this? Because I like it. There's no reason for me not to say it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and sometimes even, you know, I, I come from an education background. I, I, been a math teacher before and I work in in math education now and you know one of the things that I always found when I was teaching was I understood things better when I had to ex- try to explain them yes. because you start to become more aware of what you actually understand and don't understand and so I think the same thing has been true for my painting too because I can just sit there and just be like oh I've done this before and I'm just you know painting the mono but as soon as somebody asks me why did you do this this way like, why did I do it this way? Or, yeah. you know, how exactly? And it, it's, it sort of makes me more aware of the actual process I'm going by, I'm going through in painting. And, and I've actually found that helps me to, to try new things and realize, you know, I, I have been doing it this way and I really can't explain why I'm doing it this way. Maybe it's not even the best option or, you know, I can't think of any specific examples off the top of my head, but I just know that just that process of reflecting yeah. on the painting process itself, um, it has been really helpful to me. And so, um, I enjoy that part of the hobby. Now, my son wanted to know why gorilla with a brush, why not chimpanzee with a ukulele? Yeah, that that's great. Um, well, you can't paint with a ukulele, so <laughs> that's probably not the no. Um, so the I've been sort of semi well known in different um, different circles throughout my painting career. I, I got started painting really. Um, in the late 90s in terms of taking it seriously you know my my hero quest painting days were in the early 90s when that game first came out but in terms of sitting down and being like i'm gonna paint something cool i'm gonna try to get better that was like the late 90s and started off in gw i actually won some golden demon awards in the early 2000s so people kind of knew me from there just by my name or by my work um eventually i transition into other games. I was kind of well known as Arizona Troll for a while with the Privateer Press games. But now that I I'm kind of transitioned, I don't play too much anymore. I wanted a brand that was my own that was really just about me and not about me within a, a certain specific gaming yeah. community. And so I wanted two things. I wanted something that was a little self-deprecating and I wanted something that was memorable when people would see it. So I got that little cartoon gorilla. So when I put, slap that on my finished pictures, people are going to see that and go, I've recognized that symbol before. You know, so it's, it stands out a little bit. <clears throat> and in terms of the other aspect of that, I just kind of thought about what's, what's the funniest image I can think of of a person painting something. And it's, you know, Coco the gorilla. Not to make fun of yeah, Coco the gorilla. Yeah. She's obviously a gorilla. But, you know, she's painting these pictures. And it's really cool that there was a gorilla who was like, I want to paint and I enjoy this and painting canvases. But at the same time, picturing her holding a tiny little miniature with like little glasses on yeah, the end of her yeah. nose and, you know, painting a, a design on a shield or something just made me laugh. And so that was... That was my inspiration, and and then while I was getting the the logo made, I just used a picture of Coco as my my original um, uh, profile picture for a while. But no, I totally get the uh, not taking things seriously. I mean, that's why our channel's called Crit Fail. Yeah, <laughs> it was the same thing. Like, we, we always wanted when we sat down and talked about it. We went like it on the very off chance it was like we ever got seriously big. If that ever actually happened, we would always have to say. Welcome to Crit Fail. Yeah, exactly. And that was always, <laughs> where we always roll one. <laughs> exactly. It was always that then that that grounding thing where we always like hopefully that if you know even if we did end up with a lot of success, we would never get arrogant or stupid about it because the name the the, the very essence of the channel is a is a level of just don't take things too seriously. Right. So that's very cool. Yeah. So what got you into the hobby? So initially, it sounds like just looking at the Hero Quest figures and deciding. A bit of color would not be a bad thing. Yeah, I, there's there's a lot of different things. You know, kind of looking back in hindsight, I almost feel like there was no way that I wasn't going to be in the hobby. Um, just thinking about my early childhood experiences, I I loved Legos like a lot of kids. And, you know, my favorite Legos were the Lego Knights. Yep. You know, I just built the castles. I played with them a ton. I mean, if you think about it, that's just a direct <laughs> line right into Warhammer, yeah, essentially. Yeah. But... You know, before I really knew this game existed or much about about the hobby or painting or anything in general, um, there was a hobby store near our house that was at the mall 
And whenever we'd go to the mall, I'd always want to go into the hobby store. And they had, you know, I have no idea what the models were. I'm sure they were really terrible quality, old, tin, you know, knights. But they had a glass case that just had a whole bunch of these knights all lined up. And they were painted silver and they had blue banners. And they just, I was just mesmerized by looking at these miniatures. And then I noticed that they had a section where they were selling D&D miniatures. They were selling um, Battletech miniatures. They had you know, the box of Blood Bowl there. I think they had some some of the early Space Marines miniatures. And just I would just wander in there and just look at these miniatures and kind of dream of what I could do with them. You know, I wasn't really sophisticated enough to fully imagine what the games were like, or I certainly didn't have enough money to be buying all of those miniatures. But um, it just kind of stuck with me, that that longing to, to collect those things. Um, then... I know my dad sat down with me a couple times and we built some model kits. There was a Vietnam era helicopter that he and I sat down together and built. Um, and I remember it's, it's funny, the things that stick in your mind. I just remember this one conversation. We didn't have Brown paint in our little set. We just had like a little starter set of colors and it didn't come with Brown. And my dad was showing me how you could mix red and green and get a brownish color. And just like some of those experiences just kind of, again, got me, got my mind in that that realm of this could be a cool thing to keep doing. I tried to do some other model kits, but again, as a kid, I didn't really know what I was doing. I, I can remember trying to do a, a Star Wars snow speeder. And again, I didn't know what primer was. I didn't know what spray paint. You know, I, I had like my little testers white and I was trying to paint over the gray plastic and I got like four coats in and it still looked like crud and yeah. <laughs> I stopped there. Uh, I tried to do an A10 kit and I got fairly far in that, but I never quite finished it. Um, but then eventually when hero quest came out and I saw it advertised, I think they had commercials on TV and, uh, my grandfather bought it for me when we were on vacation in Ohio with him. And that was it. I mean, I, I started, uh, that next summer, I just started painting them because I was like, these things would be really cool if they had, you know, brown pants and if the, they had silver weapons. And so I started painting them. And even though it was a few years after that, that I really got serious into the hobby, I kind of always expected that later in my life I would come back to uh, to collecting and painting the miniatures. So when I got a little bit older and I started getting my own money, I started collecting some of the early Warhammer models with the idea that I was going to make a chess set out of them. And I would go into the game store and I'd buy miniatures. Oh, this would be cool for a bishop and this would be cool for a knight. And, um, and every time I went in, the guy would say, well... Do you want to learn how to play the game? We have this demo board over here. And I've said, no, 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 no. Because I knew if I said yes and he showed me, I would be all in. So I resisted for as long as I could. And I was learning some things. But the problem was I, I was getting so much better with every model I painted that the idea that it could be a chess set was quickly out the window. Because by the, by the uh, what, the 32nd model I painted, it wouldn't look anything like the first model. So... Um, but one day my brother came home, he's five years younger than me. And he said, Oh, my, my best friend just got this cool new game called Warhammer. And I think I want to start playing and that, that, okay, I'm in, I'm in. So he bought the chaos army. I bought the high elves army. We, uh, and we started playing and, and that was again, probably 98, 99, somewhere around there. And, and I've been in the hobby pretty seriously ever since. Very cool. Mine was just D and D. Like I think, I think yeah. a lot of kids were just. I, I didn't do Warhammer. Uh, I did own the sure. books because I loved the art, but I got into D and D. So through D and D, a lot of the places had the, uh, I think the, Pal Rathra or something like that. These early, and looking at them now, they're like, oh my god, how they were so bad. They were just. Yeah. Well, those are some of those early yeah. miniatures yeah. I yeah. saw in, in the hobby store. Yeah, those Raoul Partha. Uh, yeah. That's where I. That's where I started. So what is it about miniature painting specifically compared to, like with me, I came to, uh, although I started there, my both my grandfathers served in the Second World War, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of discussions with them when I was a kid, so I sort of leaned into military kits first, a lot of aircraft and stuff like that, and then yeah. as I found D&D &D again, as I got older, I went back to figures, and I sort of do a bit of both now, and there's some awesome Star Wars kits now as well, which I sort of do, but I still feel myself more a figure painter than the others and from your right. what i've seen of your twitch and that you're definitely far more interested yes. in figures than in in vehicles or the more inanimate yeah. sort of things what is it about that, that's figures? true even within figure painting like with 40k or something where they have tanks like i just don't really like painting the vehicles you know i'm really more into the the figures and 
I, I, it's hard to answer, actually. You know, I haven't really thought about why I particularly went one path or another. When I was younger, like I said, I would go in there and look at all the Battletech miniatures. So I, I didn't really buy a bunch of them. But one thing I did do was buy the books because the pictures of the big stompy robots were like super awesome to me. And I spent a lot of time trying to redraw the Battletech robots that were in the rule book. So they have their big line drawing of the, yep. you know, like the mad cat or something. And so what I would do is I would take a large piece of paper and kind of draw a light grid. And I draw a grid over the picture of the Battletech and I would try to redraw it at a larger scale. And I remember doing tons of those drawings. And so then when it came time to do some of my first miniatures, other than the Warham or the uh, Hero Quest game, I bought some of the Battletech miniatures and I painted some of them up. And I just think that it just, it's, yeah, I don't really know exactly why, but painting those first Hero Quest miniatures, painting those first Battletech figures um, just really struck something in me that, um, that I just felt really really pleased with how things turned out. You know, I was really proud of, of what I was producing, even though looking back, they're not that good. But, you know, I was really proud of them at the time. And um, it was just relaxing. It was just a fun way to spend an afternoon. You know, you turn on music, you turn on a movie or something, and you just paint. And um, it's kind of been my relaxation ever since. I, I get in a sort of a zen mode when I'm painting, and it's uh, it's just therapeutic for me. <laughs> Which certainly, I can certainly understand that. I think, like, with, with me... With something like Star Wars, it's easy. I, I, I love Star Wars. As a, as a kid, we, we didn't have a lot of money. It was drive-ins only, and we didn't see many films. And the first one I remember when I was five was Star Wars. So doing the kits, that's easy. The mm -hmm. military stuff, the thing for me is I love the Spitfires and things like that and the beautiful engineering, but I always want to put a figure with them because when I put a figure with it, right. then it has life. I think that, right. and then I think that's why I like figures. It's like I can build a... A Spitfire and it looks good and I can put it on the shelf and I can appreciate it but if you're painting any figure even some of the crappy uh, Reaper bones it's still a figure there's still emotion there's still even right. if it's not a really highly detailed figure there's movement he you know there's something alive about that figure that an inanimate object like a Warhammer tank or a Spitfire or something like that doesn't have like with the Star Wars and the kits if I can do them flying I always will because then you'll right. get a pilot sitting inside it. The wheels will be up. It'll be simulated movement. And right. it's whereas you always have that. Every time you do a figure, there's always that simulated movement. There's always that feeling of being right. alive. And I think there's something about that that appeals to me when I'm when I'm doing it. Do you enjoy the the process of coming up with your own color schemes and things for the miniatures? Because I, I would imagine doing historical and doing um, Star Wars, you kind of feel more bound by... Uh, like whatever colors they are supposed to be. With, with Star Wars, I tend to do my own thing, and I do cop some okay. black for it. There is a certain, yeah, there's certain <laughs> elements of the community. It's like, why is that X-wing green? And it's like, oh well, the other right. pilot is this dude. No, I've got a whole backstory yeah. for it. And it's like, no, it's not Luke. I'm not saying Luke flew this one. This is a totally different. But yeah, yeah if you're going to do Red One or Red Five or whatever, then yeah, you've seen that historical ones definitely. And I think that I don't think you should agonize over that, like. I know some of, some people certainly do. That there's got, it's got to be exactly the right color. Whereas, for me, I'm happy if it's roughly the right color. If it's meant to be RAF brown, okay. if you can put them up with the real one and that one, if it's close, I'm I'm okay with it. But having said that, I still try to treat the military very serious because some of the kits you can build. If you read the front blurb, they always come with a little front blurb and it'll say who the pilot is that's in there. And occasionally, you'll be doing this thing, you'll pick it up and it'll say 1943 shot down over Germany and killed. And then it's sort of like, oh, okay, I better treat this with a bit more, right. you know. As I say, I don't think you should agonize over it, but, you know, if, you, if you're building something that some young person had, you know, died horribly in, I don't think it should be treated completely jovially sort of thing. Whereas you never have that with, when you do fantasy figures or science fiction figures right. in the same way, you can, you can just do whatever you like. Yeah. And, and so exactly. you've got the freedom of that and you don't have any of that sort of stress about, okay, which I have done a couple of times. I've got actually stressed about building the kit because I knew the story behind the real plane. Right. I don't have that if I do the Oyorie pilot from Infinity. She's just this right. really hot, chicky, powered <laughs> armor pilot. And if the picture, right. I think, is 
white with some blue and a little red if I decide to paint her all green yeah you might have some in the community you might say but that's not their color scheme but usually they're not going to freak so I, I do enjoy the process of trying to come up with something I actually have a wonderful tendency of painting myself into a narrative corner where I'll start going oh, I'm gonna, I want blue I want this figure to be blue and I'll be working on blues and if I haven't planned it out completely sometimes it works fine but a lot of times I'll suddenly stop and go okay I've got a problem here <laughs> So <laughs> I, I've been there too. Yeah. I tend to not, uh, I don't lay all, out my entire color scheme ahead of time. I, I don't know if you've caught that sometimes by watching me on Twitch, but um, you know, I'll usually just I'll have a vague notion of kind of some colors I want to use and I'll just start painting and then it's okay. I'm getting to this part. What would look good with what I already have? And you could get to the point where you go, well, uh, I got to paint this part and I don't know what would look good with all of the yep. things that are there yep. but that's where that's where browns and blacks are great because you can do different shades of browns and, and different shades of black and and those kind of neutral colors will help you out in those really big jams uh, but yeah i've been there so i've just <laughs> my, my wife is actually a, a kind of a color expert she's a interior designer and she does a lot of um, color consultations with people and so every so often i will go to her and say i I'm stuck. I need a color for this. And she usually can go, well, you need a green with just a little bit of this and a little bit of this. And I go, okay, well, here's my paints. Yeah. So exact, what, what do I, how do I mix exactly what you have in mind? And she's just grabs some things and, you know, says mix these together. But, um, like I just picked up, uh, this is just a $120 Lenovo tablet. And I probably right. got it to use Skype when I'm at my bench because it's a decent size, but a laptop takes up a lot of real estate. So I just picked, but the other thing I do is I've put, about four gigs of miniature pictures on here from all sorts of people. Um, some of yours are on here and just, it's not always stuff I'm even going to paint. I'm just looking at colors. I'll go elves and I'll just look at pictures through Google and go, Oh, that's, I like that. And sometimes maybe even the figure hasn't been painted brilliantly. And it's not about that. I just go, but that I like where right. he went with his colors. And maybe that is right. a figure I actually own or, I might have an elf or something that's similar to it, and I'll just save that. And I'll just just like three or four gig folder now of just things, and I'll just now yeah. go. I have a, I have something very similar. And I'll just yeah. go, okay, I'm going to paint this today, and then I'll just start flicking through, looking at the uh, the paint schemes other people have done for all sorts of different figures until I go, mm. oh, I wanted a green. There's a nice, oh, he's done green, and I didn't think, oh, green and yellow, or green, and I didn't think of using that. And then I'll just sort of look at how they've done it and because i have a tendency i'll start great but right in the middle you'll get that you can almost see that moment where you paint and then just be this pause yeah. where the brain just suddenly goes wait 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 you're about to make a huge mistake if you haven't already yeah. <laughs> right you know something that i think is good to mention for people watching this is that there there can sometimes especially from people who are early into the hobby or early into any kind of art um they think that the people who are more practiced and more skilled at it that like their inspiration just comes from nowhere. Like that they're just these immensely creative people and they're just creating stuff out of it. No, if you look at some of the best painters, they have people posing for them or, you know, people who are doing sketches and drawings, they will take photographs of their own hands in different positions and use that as reference. There's even canvas painters who will take photographs, project them onto the canvas to sketch out the initial kind of outlines of people and then go in and, and produce the whole scene with paint yeah. that, you know, you, any tool is good. You don't have to think that, you know, you have to come up with all your own color schemes or that, you know, if you're, if you're trying to create some cool symbol on a shield that you have to just come up with it on your, you know, we all use reference materials for, for our inspiration and the greatest artist of all time used inspiration. Yeah, so, so search for inspiration. Use it to your advantage. Yeah, because there's so many miniatures out there and you get that initial excitement. At least I do. I'll get a new figure. Like, I, I, I now have to sort of push myself back a little when I first get something because I know that's when I'm, when I'm going to make a mistake for me is when I'm excited at the start because I'm not going to I'm not going to be thinking it completely through yet. Like, I've always wanted that OURA pilot and yeah. it, where it, when it fell on the Kickstarter, I just couldn't do it. So I'm really happy that I was able to get it uh, like later on. And the first thing mm -hmm. I wanted to do when I when I got it was rip it open, glue it together, and prime it, and then just start. Yeah. But I knew that would be bad because I hadn't really thought about what I wanted to do. And that's yes, you can strip them. Yes, you can if you've done thin coats, you can just sort of paint over. But why do that if you just do it right the first time or close to? Right. I mean, mistakes are always going to be made, and 
there's a few guys that have said they haven't made a mistake in 25 years, and I'm like, uh, no, nah, we could. We, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> they just don't show their right. mistakes. That's but my, my uh, I read this somewhere, and I don't know where I saw it, but it said like the difference between a professional and an amateur is the professional doesn't show you his mistakes. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I I remember we were at a, a club once, and this guy had painted this amazing figure of a knight, and he was at the end of it it was the last job and he was busy talking not paying attention and he picked up his varnish and <laughs> sprayed black primer <sighs> and the black primer and the clear varnish both caps off side by side big sigh oh, put it down yeah anyone will be starting this again there's yep. a lesson to be learned here <laughs> I remember I, it wasn't quite that. It was more of a damaging model story. But one of my worst stories about that was I had this really, really highly converted Thousand Suns uh, Dreadnought and also a really highly converted Thousand Suns Lord in Chaos Armor. And I was showing somebody, or Terminator Armor, I was showing somebody the Lord and I, he just slipped out of my hands and I dropped him in the, the game store had a, a wood floor over concrete. So this is not the thing you want to drop your model on. So he hit and I hear him shatter and I, I bent down to grab him and my shirt caught on the, the gun of my dreadnought <sighs> and pulled him off the table and knocked him down behind me and I hear him drop and shatter. And that was just one of those moments where you kind of like, can I play, press re rewind? Can I just redo the last 15 seconds of my life, please? Because <laughs> that, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Yeah, that was... And that's terrible, I, too, because the guy who you're showing, he's going to feel bad because he's going to feel partly yeah. to blame because he wanted to see your stuff. Right. So he's feeling guilty and... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My problem there is the we cat. We all have Yeah, my problem is the cat. He comes in. I, I've been trying to sort my room out. I put my... Um, all my minis along the top that I'm working on. And he is a idiot. And likes to get up there. And I came in the other day, and all the minis that were up there were now on the desk. So none had broken, but a couple that I'd been working on had chips, which is like, oh. I'm going to start this again. And then he'll look all cute and like, it wasn't me. And it's like, I'm, no, right. hey, <laughs> go away. <laughs> so my problem seems to be the cat at the moment when it comes to damaging things. Yeah. But yeah, I, I've dropped my fair share, um, which actually brings me to with tools, your favorite tools. And do you think it changes from beginner to more advanced? Because I used to um, just hold the mini. When I first started, you just hold the mini. Mm -hmm. But I found that they're the top heavy. And so many times, you right. and you go, bang. You pick him up, bang, and just keep doing it. So I don't know if I have one here. Oh, yeah. These are just pill bottles. That So now I put blue tack mm -hmm. on the top. And I use that, but yep. you use the fancy Kickstarter one that came out with the curve. Yeah, I uh, use the the Rathcore holders, and and for so, I've always held my miniatures like this. So I've always just found a place as like, I don't care. I'm going to rub primer off, whatever. It's going to be the top of a sword, the top of a head, and I would just paint that last. So I paint everything else in the model and paint my my contact point. But I would always hold like this. It was always very comfortable for me. I could brace on my hand to do tiny detail work. I've never been able to really like the pill bottle thing just doesn't quite do it for me. Like I feel like I need more contact points on the miniature. And so when the Rathcore miniature or holders were shown, those just looked like that's exactly what I need. Um, I got them and honestly, that is my favorite tool now. I, I can hardly imagine painting without using those now. Um, and so there's a couple, that girl and wolf model I painted recently was way too large to fit on one yeah. of those. And that was, Going back to having to hold a miniature in different ways was it's like, oh, no, I, I want to do miniatures I can hold <laughs> on my Rathcore holders. Um, and, and it's funny that th this may be a future, another question you're going to ask me later, but the if you were to ask me what's the most common question that you get from people, the number one most common question I get is, where did you get that holder? <laughs> It'll be, you know, I, I post pictures like, okay, I've got this minute. I just did something really cool. I'm really proud of what I just did. Post some pictures of this on social media and be like, hey, guys, just finished this really cool tartan pattern or something. What do you think? And then, you know, you sit back and you wait for people to kind of comment. And then it's always like, hey, where'd you get that holder? <laughs> <laughs> but that's all right. They, they, those are definitely my favorite tool. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that just in general, things like paintbrushes and stuff are obvious tools that you have. Um, and and paints and, and clearly. But I think that it's an interesting question to think about beginners and um, like what level should they start? Because some people will say, well, when you're a beginner, just buy cheap brushes because you're not going to know how to take care of them. Or, you know, don't worry about buying like the most expensive paints. Maybe you can just buy craft store paints to start with or something like that. But um, I mean, I think there's a there's certainly a fine line between, OK, don't buy the entire mega paint set if you're just getting yeah. started you don't need that and don't buy 25 dollar you know, super expensive kalinsky sable brushes but if you if you want to feel like you're doing something good you want to do a good job because you want to be inspired you want to after you paint your first miniature you want to immediately feel like i want to paint another one of these the more you shortchange yourself in that beginning process uh you know buying craft store paints that aren't really made for miniature paints or buying really, really cheap brushes, it it's going to compromise the quality of what you're able to produce. And I think it's potentially going to maybe turn you off of, of the hobby because I think people have to experience some early success, something that they feel proud of in order to, to feel like they want to keep yes. doing it. Um, and, and I also think a similar comment would be, you know, you can buy the Bones miniatures or something like that, which are super cheap. Um, they're a good entry point in terms of you're not spending $30 on a model. But at the same time, I think that the first few models you paint especially should be something that excite yeah. you. Because again, it should be something that makes you want to keep coming back to the table. It makes you want to do something cool. It makes you want to take your time on the miniature. Um, I think those are some important things to think about as a beginner. Don't just, well, I don't care. I don't know how to, what I'm doing, so let me just slap some paint on a miniature. I, I think that... Um, that might be self-defeating a little bit for people who are just getting in. Like I think that um, for, for me, the D and D side of things, the bones are amazing because it's so touched. But I, I've, I've started to, and I used to suggest them to beginners all the time because you could spend if you had, especially although for kids, I still do. If they got ten bucks, they yeah. can walk out with five miniatures. Yeah. You know? So quantity with a kid sometimes is more than yes. quantity sort of thing. But I agree for a more adult painter now teens and adults i've started saying the reaper still but their metal line because yeah. side by side some of the metals are actually drastically better than the bones and i just did a swashbuckler for a friend and i think that cost him seven dollars and it was a nice figure now it wasn't infinity yep. or raging heroes or some of the privateer right. press quality but it was nice and certainly nice enough that you'd be happy with like if for a beginner it's not like soft it's not crappy detail there's no deformity everything's like proper the it had lacing on her bodice right. and on the back like it was defined lacing yeah. it wasn't simulated lacing so there was a lot of detail to sort of you know as you start to learn oh, i get to do lacing and how to do shadowing in between the lacing and then the coat around it and the shirt and there's gloves yeah. and the sword had it wasn't just one blocky thing it was a swept hilt uh, you know, sort of rapier. So I've started leaning a bit towards the metal for sort of the, for that sort of yeah. thing. To say no, you should you can find something there that's nice enough that you want to come and do it. It's, you're not going to be just feeling like oh, I'm just doing something, but it's not spending thirty dollars on. I think it's my raging hero's sister there. She was I think cost thirty bucks with shipping, and she's she's yeah. a twenty eight. I mean, she's resin. She's awesome, but she was twenty eight bucks. Um, right. Which it's that's yeah. yeah I mean. I think that the interesting thing is that really the the what you produce when you do miniature painting, it's almost a symbiotic work that you're doing with the sculptor. I mean, it's the quality of the sculpt goes so far yep. to the quality of the final paint job. And so, yeah, if you're if you're working on a model that has mushy details, that has you, there's no way that you're going to help make that look better by doing by doing paint yes. jobs so you, you might as well start off with a pretty highly detailed figure at least in terms of having really crisp details it doesn't have to be something with like tons of little stuff yep. that you have to yep. worry about all over but just really nice sharp details because again you i think it's really important early on to to feel pride in the early products you create to keep you coming back for more and realizing that hey i can get better at this i can have fun with it um, and I don't like. I don't do like something that cool on my I shelf. do not like confusion on a mini. I do not like um, like mm. the new Legion figures from Star Wars look really good, but some of the Imperial Assault ones 
Now, okay, they're designed for being used on a board. They're not a showpiece, but still, there are times I'm actually about to put brush to, to figure, and I'm looking at part of it, and I don't know what it is. Yeah. And I don't like that. I, I want to know when I'm looking at a figure, that's a pouch. That's a mage, a mage pouch. That's a belt. That's his ties. That's laces. That's leather boots. That's what I don't ever want to be looking at a figure and be going, the hell is that? Is that part of his cape yeah. that's like, or is that... You know, and, and so I definitely think that for beginners, having something that's a, a block, yeah, I agree. It's not, it's not, because they're not going to feel, yeah, they're not going to want to come back to that. Yeah. Like, I, I, we used to experiment, we used to have a joke where when we used to go, oh, I'm going to experiment with something, and it was always on a really expensive figure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm going to try mud or something, and it's like, it, yeah. that's your $90 Iron Man. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And we all did it. So now I'm like, no, no, use the bones, dude. Pay two bucks. Try yeah. something radical. And if it works on the bones, it'll probably work on your metal or whatever. But if it doesn't work right. on the bones, don't put it on a $50 figure. Right. So, because our purposes generally differ, although I want to get back to doing some of my more mm -hmm. showpiece, but I've done a lot in the last couple of years and have just been RPG focused. Do you think that the figure that you choose helps your process when it comes to painting? Yeah, absolutely. But um, say more about what you're... Well, for me, like with the bones, because I mean, I've done a lot because that's what, with my commissions, that's what <laughs> I've got. Most people were buying the bones and give, so I ended up doing a lot of bones. And I found the bones definitely were aiding the, the process for what they were looking for. Ease of use. Uh, it took color well. It didn't matter if it wasn't spe like spectacular. They, I found a lot of the, the, you know, those sort of customers weren't weren't caring. And it didn't mean that they didn't take any pride mm -hmm. in anything. They just, they just wanted something that was on the table that wasn't white. They wanted it to, right. if they or they have a color scheme a bit that they like. They wanted him to be black. They wanted him to be blue, but they weren't really worried about too much about it. Whereas uh, Vanya over there, who's um, and Zayna. That I've got the two, the fire giant, and then the goblin queen. Uh, they're in a whole different category. Or the sister from Re Raging Heroes. Mm -hmm. She's a completely different um, category of figure. She's 28 mil still, but the detail on that Raging Heroes right. figure is is completely different. And I found that when I was looking at her and going to think about how to paint her, it wasn't just the detail that was separating the two figures. It was my mental process of how I was going to approach this figure was changing based on the figure itself, not just the detail, like obviously meaning you look at a knight, you go metals. You look at a half-naked female elf, you're going to go cloth and skin. But the actual process of how am I going to come at this figure and is the figure actually going to help me when I when I go to do that, when I go, I want it to be like this and I want it to, this part, so I want to be really cool. Sometimes I feel the figure does for for me when I like her. She definitely does the the sister of whatever the hell they're called. I'm sure if you've seen the Raging Heroes, it's a whole new line. It's all their yeah, battle nuts. Yeah. And she totally sort of when I think about the way I want to do the cloth and that it's almost like the figure's mm -hmm. like yeah yeah that's that's totally how you should do it on me. That's how it's going to work. And I sometimes feel that's very true with a figure that I'll sit down and I go, okay, this has to be a showpiece or whatever. And the figure's totally like, oh yeah, I can help you. Like right from the word go, yeah, it's like, yeah. I can help you do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the thing I, I more recently, cause again, I, I used to paint mostly just for games that I played, um, you know, still to a really high quality. In fact, my troll bloods army for privateer press, I, I think I played the game for five years and about the time I was, I was getting out of the game. I finally had two fully painted lists that I could play. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, I, I painted every model, not, not to my best, but you know, 90 to 95% of my best, um, my best work on pretty much every model that was in that army. So, um, super impressive to look at on the tabletop. And I, I always felt like when somebody saw my army, I wanted it to be like, that's that guy's army. Like it, I wanted to stand out, not just be, well, this is the models I play with, but these are the models I yeah, paint. Yeah. Like I didn't really, that's, that's not really my, I, I like, I take pride in every model that I paint. So, um, the, but I, I started going to the larger scale miniatures in the last year or so. So I painted the, those two orcs from Ouroboros miniatures and just going up in scale, 
so you're you're trying to do a pouch, but the pouch is, you know, if you think about volume wise, it's you know like six or eight times as large as the pouch that was on the twenty eight yep. millimeter figure that you just yep. painted. And you're like, okay, well, if I just use exactly the same techniques that I painted on that pouch on the smaller guy, it's not going to look good at this size. You know, there it's going to look blockier. It's going to have not as nice transitions with the color. So it forces me to be more careful as I'm painting and, and take more time, build up more layers, do more glazing, do more shadowing, and, and really forced me to learn new techniques. It pushed, pushed me. And the fact that the, de- the models were so detailed just inspired me to want to make them look better. So certainly I, I, I understand what you're saying there. And then with Ali, the, the model I've been working on on Twitch, same thing, you know, her being a 75 millimeter scale model, you know, I wanted to take extra time with the skin. I wanted to take extra time and put camo patterns in her leggings. And just, you know, it really inspired me to, to kind of put everything I knew to use and try some new things even to make her just look really awesome. Something else that I feel like I'm kind of known for is is freehand detail. Yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and part of that is just, you know, painting a miniature is a little bit like paint by numbers in the sense that there's defined areas on the miniature. And so, you know, if she has shorts, you're like, okay, I'm painting these shorts. I can choose the color, but they're still, they're going to look like shorts, you know? And so to me, the, the free hand is where I get to put myself into the miniature so that when it's done, people can look at it and say like, I can see you and you, your creativity in this miniature, not just by the colors you picked, but, by the details that you added that weren't already there. So I often look for miniatures that have as much space on them that inspires me to fill it with something that is going to challenge yeah. me and, and just be really cool. Um, like I know what you're talking about with the pouch. Cause I remember the first large scale figure I ever painted, my brother came in and he looked at the, at the backpack and he went, that looks crap, but I don't know why. And it was because I painted it the same. I was feeling the same. Because mm-hmm. when you're a beginner, you can paint a pouch on a 28 mil brown and give it a wash. And it seeps in a little and it looks all right. You, you can look at it and go, yeah, it's all right. You're happy with it. But when that pouch is the size of a backpack, and then a backpack on a 28 mil is now the size of a whole figure, right. that same technique of just doing a simple wash over it, does not, it, lo- it doesn't look like that. You, yeah. you you got to add. You got to right. add extra texture. Right. You got to add extra shadows. You got to do lots of extra stuff. Because that wash hasn't yeah. done that same technique on the small one. That wash gives you simulated shadow, but on a larger scale, you can't simulate it because it's, yep. you, it doesn't work that way. It's you, it just looks like you've put brown mud, like wet mud or something, yeah. on it. Not it, it. The effect that you get on the little doesn't work when you upscale it. You've got to completely relearn how to do something. So. Uh, I, I totally understand like that because I've just um, the last Kickstarter we did was I think it was the um, Android I think that was Ouroboros as well that was their last Kickstarter I think that was them I think I think so it's yeah I haven't I haven't bought into their last couple um, Kickstarter I, I'm trying really hard to not buy any models this but year a, so <laughs> it's an Android where she has yeah. ripped off the outer oh yeah so yeah so it's like yeah. skin it's hair skin halfway down a face then metal because you get the tear and then huh. just above the bust is the tear where it's like all been She's actually terrifying me as a figure. I haven't got it yet, but looking at the pictures, because I'm really like, what I have to do here is transition, like really, really good transitions. And that's the thing that's that's worrying me about that. If she was 28 mil, I'd not be worried at all. But this is, this is a full size one six scale bust. And I haven't done a lot of them. That's moving into a new sort of direction for me yeah and i am a little bit worried about that one i'm gonna have to really take my time to try to get that nice skin tone and then solid steel because that's what i want i want a really big contrast between soft feminine skin and then suddenly industrial grade terminator sort of steel and i was thinking a lot of people have been talking about doing really shiny steel and i Mm -hmm. was thinking more gun metal i like the idea of it being not that really bright shiny metal but a darker deeper grittier not rusty but just yeah i know exactly so what you're trying talking to, about yeah I'm, I'm sitting there, i'm trying to look at techniques and found a lot for 28 mil and i'm like no this is not going to work i need i need to know how to <laughs> do that blending into the the two from in, in a bigger scale so that one's going to be and eyes that's a i've been using your eye technique yeah. on all my 28s oh, it's good. just 
suit there, you know, <laughs> done. <laughs> yeah. Into the box. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, yeah. When I figured that technique out I, from, from like sort of adapting what other people were doing, just this idea that you're not really painting the eye, you're sort of painting everything else. Like, you know, yeah, it's, it's amazing how well it works. Before I felt like I was a sniper take, trying to take a two kilometer shot and sit there and you get the, and it's like, breathe, hold. Yeah. <laughs> that one's good. Don't. Oh! Start oh, again. Yeah. Repaint it. Yep. <laughs> all afternoon, all I do is one pair of eyes sort of thing. So this is just a, dip, dip, yeah, we're done. So that's yeah. been great. I'm sure you can share a link. You can yeah. put a link to that, that eye video. Um, so people know what we're yeah, talking no, about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great technique. Um, and it the, works. You, yeah, you can turn the, like, you can do it in the corner, mm -hmm. and then the corners where they're looking, it's, oh, it works in every way. It's great. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, so speaking of models that you buy that terrify you, I bought the Atonement miniature, the special edition Atonement min miniature from Michael Contreras that he put out a year or two. I don't know I, if you're familiar with that. If you're I, not, I might have seen it, but uh, the name doesn't ring a bell. Yeah, look, it's, it's, he, he sculpted it for one of these crystal brush com competitions. He might've even have won it, but I think somebody else painted it. He sculpted it, but I think somebody else painted it for the competition, but it's this kind of weird night with wings that look almost like they're metallic wings. And then a girl is, jumped into his arms and she's kissing his helmet and she's oh, got a flowy oh, skirt I I have seen it. and he's standing on a book yes the book has flowers yes, coming all off of it. it so yeah so i bought that miniature and that thing scares the crap out of me and that's part of why i bought it because eventually when i get around to that that's going to be sort of the miniature i invest everything into like all the things i've learned and try to push my myself to the limit with that miniature and you're gonna do all the videos like offline until it's done and then you go like oh yeah okay thank god okay now i can post them yeah. <laughs> now that now that i, I know that i didn't exactly. screw it up too it's badly not in the bin. and what's what's interesting to me is he's got he's got a page that's got the laser etched um words yeah. and stuff into it but i'm really really tempted to use plastic card to create just or maybe he even included them but to have a blank page and do my own um lettering within the book and really push my free hand uh on that so we'll see so what is your favorite company or companies overall so that is a really good question um you know i feel like we've kind of entered into this almost golden age of miniatures right now because if we were so spoiled with choice that everybody and their mother's putting out a miniature now and it seems like they're all fantastic uh, I think I really like, as I said, I'm really liking getting into the 75 millimeter scale models. So uh, Black Sun miniatures, um, yep. I haven't actually painted any of them, but I bought like eight or so of their 75 millimeter scale. And just seeing them in person, they kind of have a, a gritty fantasy feel to them, um, which I'm really looking forward to get into. And then scale 75, 75 millimeter scales, they're, they're kind of a very different style. They're a little cleaner. Um, a little bit more focused on kind of the steampunk slash um, animation look to them. And so um, I bought a bunch of those and, and I'm looking forward to paint them. The In terms of what I've painted over time, um, it's a good question. I, I mean, the, the Ouroboros orcs were good. I haven't bought any of their other models, but those Ouroboros orcs were probably some of the, especially the Brave, the one with the axe. Mm -hmm. He's maybe my favorite model I've ever painted. Just the pure combination of detail and character that he has is, is just, it was just so much fun to paint him. Um, I would say I, maybe Atlantis miniatures might be my current uh, go-to answer for that just because i feel like he's done an amazing job of capturing um like personality in the models so if you look at his dwarves they exude dwarfness without being gw dwarves yes. you know they there's just there's something about if you can just they're realistic fantasy dwarves yep, absolutely and he's He's done really cool uh, interpretations like the female dwarves because the male dwarves have these massive beards and dwarves are always known by their beards. But you didn't want to put a beard on the female dwarves. You wouldn't be able to tell that they were female. So he did these in crazy braids 
And so they just have essentially hair that would be maybe two or three times as long as they are if they were <laughs> if they grew it all out. But then they're all done in these yeah. complicated braids, and it's just such a a cool take on you know a dwarf culture for that. Similarly with his orcs, um, like the orc banner bearer has a backpack with wooden stakes, and it's just got leather draped on it. So the idea that they didn't they didn't make like a GW orc banner with you know moons painted on or something. They're just carrying something to, that's visible mm-hmm. on the battlefield. That's all it is. And so just those little things just kind of it see, it speaks to a backstory of the cultures that these models would be from that that I just find really cool. Um, even his troll miniatures, they're all in very cool kind of action poses, but. I think in terms of for gamers and stuff, one of the nice things about those miniatures is he tries to minimize the number of parts. So they're really highly detailed, but you're not getting a sprue yeah. where it's like, okay, you're going to put this dwarf together and it's got 12 parts to it. It's like, you're going to put this dwarf together and it's either one piece or it's one body and an arm and a shield or um, the Etten, the large Etten, there's just a huge, huge yeah. model was four was four pieces. And so for people who are collecting them, either for doing um, painting or for doing um, like using them as a replacement giant in their army or doing them for a D&D thing, it's not a huge barrier in terms of the modeling side of things to get it on the table. But then it has so much detail and expression that as a painter, you can really play with it and have fun. So I, I think they're probably my favorite miniature company at the moment just for overall, like if I could just recommend almost anybody no matter what you're trying to do, if you're trying to get models for play or for painting, you can you can go Just to them. That, the construction is definitely a, I, I think, a barrier for some for some people, especially beginners, because when you when you're good at it, you still might not like always enjoy it. Like I don't know, I I build models, and that's all that is. It's construction before paint, and the zero I have in 132 scale is a box this filled with sprues. So that's the gig, but. I don't always want to do that. There's days I'm I want to paint, and sometimes when I when I'm yeah. excited about a figure, it's not because I'm thinking about building it; it's because I'm thinking about painting it. Yeah. And I definitely think for beginners, if it's a metal one especially, because if it's metal, you're using super glue. And I think we've all yeah. glued parts of them to ourselves at some point. You'll get an arm, you'll put the glue on, you'll be holding the arm in place, you'll be talking to your friend, you'll put it down, you take your hand away, and the the figure's like dangling, and you're yeah. like, oh, what the hell? And then you. And they fall up. They fall yep. apart too, which is frustrating for people who are getting in the, into the hobby and they don't know about pinning, yep. and they're really not going to take that time. So and, having yeah figures um, that can be just quickly. That's why I like the Reapers. A lot of them are one piece metal. Um, I love uh, Hassle Free. Uh, he does some really nice sculpts. And one thing that I like about him is he does a lot of uh, naked chickies, but he does a lot of naked guys. It's a truly fifty yeah. fifty. He just likes the human form he just likes yeah. naked he just yeah, likes so, naked models <laughs> i mean i did their their last kickstarter and what i loved about that one and what drew me to it was they did 12 models i think was the base and they did naked pin up winter and then like antarctic winter like games of thrones winter is coming okay so most of the ones i think i chose were winter because they had the coats and boots and more gear and so uh-huh. But it was all the way across, and there were some guy figures in there too that were the same, naked, then like a pin-up, and then winter, and then frost. So you chose which one you were most interested in, which one you were most comfortable in. You know, for for me, I could choose any. Uh, my daughter, who's 12, likes certain ones. I've, I've been sh- selective with what I showed her, obviously, but she likes some, so I yeah. can get the... If she likes... If I think that's cool, I'll, I'd be... Just send her a picture of the frost, and say, so you like... And she said, oh, yeah, I really like that one. So I, you know, got her a couple of those. But I do like... Atlantis. The thing that I would not turned me off Atlantis was because that, that that's too harsh a thing. But I really mm-hmm. like the dwarf. The one I wanted to get that was when they did their Kickstarter, and I didn't do it, but I looked at it, and it was a female dwarf, the queen, and she yeah. because she looked pissed off. And I thought, yeah. you know what? There's so many people do queens that are in these sort of pin y poses that are all right. just you know, floofy and queeny and big boobs and stuff. And here was this dwarf queen. She had both hands on the side of a throne. She was leaning forward. She had the braids. And it was like, what are you yeah. doing in my kingdom? And it's like, yeah, exactly. okay, I feel... I've... She's right next to the king and you they both exude the same level of yeah. power. And uh, But yeah. the thing that turned me off in, in, in that way was that the at the time, the release date 
was quite a ways away. And that was the only thing. I was like, oh, I really want it. But I, it's, and that's fine with the pre-order. It's not like they were, they were saying pay now and then suddenly went, oh, there was no, you know, there was right. no dodginess going on. But it was just, I looked at when it was coming out and I was like, oh no, it's like at the time yeah. it was next, it was next year. And I was like, no, I yeah. want it. I want it. So I was like, I'll, I'll buy something else. And I found a few when I went on their side, I went, oh, I want that. And it was like coming, you know, May 2018. I'm like, ah, oh, no, May 2019. No, no, I want, I want some stuff yeah. now. I mean, that's obviously not his fault. They're obviously having to... Right. Get, get ramped up and I'm hoping as time goes on they'll be like yeah here's stuff coming but we've got stuff in stock and that's what I'm hoping they'll get to but because that was the thing like some of those dwarves I wanted the females more than the males only because absolutely only because there's so many female dwarves have been rubbish from other companies really and this yeah. is the first time I'm like no I, female warriors female the queen I, was, I felt her power and I was like yeah I like yeah. that that's cool so yeah, I, it's funny because I, I did the pre-order last year for some of the dwarves that I really liked. And I, I think I ordered maybe half a dozen, like six models. And I think four of them were females. I ordered the queen. I ordered the king. Um, I ordered the female warrior on the saber tooth tiger. Yeah. You know, she's like really powerful up there. And so I definitely ordered some of those. And I haven't got my order yet, but I've got the other dwarves because he sent them to me because I'm actually painting those for him uh, to use for stuff. But I, you know, I got the bags of them and just looking at the quality, like the detail on these models at, at the scale they're at is just, is just fantastic. And I just love his take again to say, to repeat myself, but those, those female dwarves are just, they just scream badass yeah. to me. So I'm, I love I'm, it. I'm waiting for them to come into actual stock and then I'm going to, going to yeah. pick some up. But yeah, that's the only thing I have that about Atlantis that it, it's a dislike, but I'm not blaming them. It's just the length of time right. between here yeah. it is to they're just there's they're kind of a small time right. operation it's just yeah. hard for them to ramp up yeah uh, no i totally but get I'm hoping that. as time goes on uh, that'll, that'll be something that'll minimize as they actually can start to got yep, new stuff stuff in stock and then yeah i'll just be i'll definitely be buying their stuff because orcs i need orcs the dwarves look great especially the females that was that was the thing that impressed me it's like yeah okay i believe these are female dwarves she looks like you give because even there's so many like i like reaper but they're, they're just sort of 2d female dwarves really you know they're not they just sort of shrunk down something big and went, ah, female dwarf. Whereas these ones, like, yeah, I don't want to fight her. She's got a great big axe and yeah, exactly. <laughs> she's going to win. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Feel, I feel them. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping they're going to come in stock and then I'll, I'll pick them up. But, uh, I mean, I like the um, Raging Heroes a lot. Yeah. Uh, I don't like all their stuff. They're a bit, for the same reason I don't always like GW. I like some of G, the way GW did things, but they sometimes went too far for me with just yeah. stuff at some point i didn't know where to look so so yeah i mean not to interrupt you but yeah on the gw thing it's there i'm torn with them a lot of times and i don't always love painting their miniatures not because they don't look fantastic because anyone who looks at their stuff you have to admit that you know they're some of the best sculptors in the game they the quality of the plastics they use is fantastic but there's two things that always that just stick out to me as a painter one is the fact that because they use hard plastic, they can't do undercuts. And that makes it really hard to do organic shapes in a natural way. So, you know, faces of models or like if you look at the Age of Sigmar stuff when it started coming out, that beast that the captain guy rides in the starter box, you look at the paws on that beast, you're like, it looks like he's a stone statue, not a real creature. And so, you know, th that stuff just sticks out to me and, and bugs me a little bit. And... It's almost like the look of it's never been touched by a human hand. It is computer sculpted, but you can feel that coldness sometimes in those organic models. And the other thing is, they, like you said, they put details everywhere. It's like, oh, there's a flat surface here. Let's put a skull. There's a flat surface here. Let's put just tons of details. And to, for their, to their credit, the reason they do this, I think, is because they're, the technique they teach people is base, layer, highlight, wash, or you know, yeah, some combination yeah. of that order. And when you're doing the wash technique on that scale miniatures, all those details just pop and look amazing. And so people who are not that skilled of painters, not saying that in a bad way, but just, yeah. you know, they just either want to produce something quickly to get a table, you know, fully painted army on the table, or they just want something that's serviceable. You do that technique and that wash is going to make all those details pop and it's going to look really good. But for somebody who wants to take their time and actually paint every little detail, you're committing like three times the amount of time to paint a GW model as a sort of comparable model from a different company. Yeah. Um, I also, I, I can remember the time when they started putting 
sculpted detail on their flags and shields. Every shield now had a raised surface that was a lion head or a symbol. Every banner had a raised design on it. And for me, who's all about like adding freehand to models, it's like, you've ruined it. You've ruined it. Uh, you know how much work I have to do to get that off or replace it with something else? Um, and so that's, you know, that's all personal taste. I'm, I'm not going to say that GW models are terrible. They certainly, um, they're some of the top uh, model makers in the business, but those are just some of my little qualms about uh, uh, painting a lot of their, their stuff. Because I think that's the thing with like the Raging Heroes, the ones that are I'm pulled to with the sisters, they have a lot of gear, they have a lot of stuff. They'll have gun belts, they'll have ammo, they'll have pouches, they'll have stuff that I can look at and go, cool, i got stuff to paint. This isn't a two minute just, yeah, black, 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 boot shiny, uh, matte the coat, yeah, she's done. There's a lot there, but they've got some that they added there's one she's their standard bearer and she's really cool and she's holding the thing she's got a gun or if you get the fantasy she's got the sword and she's great but the standard is this massive just complex thing it's almost like candles in a thing it's, it's obviously based on some they've based it on some um, religious artifact sort of thing but it's so overdone that every time I look at that picture I, my, I don't know whether to look at that first or the figure and that's for okay. me where I don't like I want to be always it's like a painting. Usually, when you walk up to a painting, you should be able to look at it, and one thing's caught your eye first. The sun, the uh -huh. house, the person, whatever it is. And then you start exploring the rest and seeing, oh, he's painted a duck in the corner, or there's some amazing flower thing on her blouse or something. But there's usually one thing that catches your eye. GW, and sometimes Raging Heroes, it's just this explosion of detail. Yeah. That I don't know where to where to look. And yeah. Because actually, question six was, is there any companies that could do better? And I think it's both Raging yeah. Heroes to me and GW. And they're both brilliant and could do better at the same at the same time. Right, I agree. I, I am really excited, actually, with... Um, I think her name's Marathi. She's the um, Lizard Folk, which is the new Age of Sigma set coming out. And, and this okay. I actually saw these picks now. This is the first time in a long time I've been excited about something from GW. Because they're not overdone they're like the half okay i'll have to look at those i haven't seen they're half, yet. They're, they're like the naga the bottom half is the snake the top half is the the female and their uh queen is big she's a she's about that she's a big model with wings and but it's a half snake and she's really cool oh yeah 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 and they're just her, uh, yeah the little troopies are the same they've got different ones that are and i was like wow i actually think they've not gone too far and there's a lot of interesting designs and it's the same. I mean, I love Raging Heroes. There are some... Uh, the new one I saw the picture of, it's only available, and that's the only... There's a complaint, if I've walked through better. It's great that they released these packs, which had the new, new knight, the knight with the horse, and the braid is all... Its mane is braided and stuff. I was blown away. 28 mil figure. The, not too much detail. That's the thing. It's a lot, but it's not too much. Horse, knighted mm -hmm. female sister. She's incredible. Only available at the moment in a pack. The pack's $240. Oh, now, okay, you're getting a bunch of figures, but that's the only way you can get it because it's coming out at the end yeah. of the year. It's sort of like the, the, I think what they're doing is they're getting a bunch in at the start to check. These are their proof of manufacture. And then if they're fine, mm -hmm. they go, okay, we'll sell this. No, that one's got problems. This one's fine. And they make 10 packs or whatever and say, okay, there they are. There are only 10 packs available until the end of the year, which is fine. I get it. But it's like, oh, I want that. But 200, do I want right. to spend 200? I'll get them all, but do I want to spend 250 bucks right now? That's that's sort of my complaint. There's a lot of their new deals are all these big, massively expensive packs, yeah. and that's the only thing with them. And GW was priced too. I mean, like it's the same. I'm right. I'm completely on board railroading that one. Everyone's like, why didn't you GW price? Yeah, it's like, there's nothing. Yeah, <laughs> they've just been expensive for a while. Right. But I think they're the only yeah. two and that really stand out for me. Is I mean, everyone could say they could do better. It's not like. Yeah, every right. every company, every channel, every everything could always do better. But the two that yeah, I think are both absolutely. brilliant that have real brilliance in them, but could do a little bit better is Raging Heroes and GW. Yeah, I, I think the funny thing is on GW, if you go watch somebody like one of these really, really massively talented painters who take their time and try to create show pieces out of the GW models, you just follow them and they're painting them for yep. months and months and months because of of just how highly detailed yep. they are. And again, it, it's, it, it, there's a good part to that and a bad part to that. And 
Um, I think they're great for making the the more amateur painters create something that they can really be like, this is amazing, and can get their friends into the hobby. They can show this cool stuff off. But just for my own purposes, there there's just too much going on on those yeah. models. Actually, one that's come out recently that really surprised me that I love is the Doctor Who miniature range. I haven't they're seen from that. Warlord, Warlord mainly did um, games, and this is a game as well. That specifically, that's what they use, like bolt action, fantastic World War Two yeah. game. Um, and actually you can paint them up quite nicely they're heroic they've got that slightly wrong shape yeah. but not terrible but the Doctor Who ones 28 mil real scale so they're like infinity wow. like the companions are properly proportioned in every way and they're metal and they've been all one piece for the metal so far and they've been gorgeous for 28 mil figures they, uh -huh. I've been really surprised like if you're a fan of the show you pick up rose and you can see it in 28 mil you can see the facial features is rose so i don't know if they've been uh laser scanning or anything like that but the detail in a 28 mil fig has been absolutely spectacular so i've been really imp you've got to obviously like doctor who it's very specific yeah. but if you do those figures have been really surprisingly good what do you think's been your best mini Ooh, good and, question. Well, maybe um, not best, even favorite. It doesn't have to necessarily be the one you think is technically your best, but the one that when you look at, you're always like, this is the one that I'm... So two immediately pop out to me, which are not... Um, so I can have sentimental favorites for just of this model was important in my painting process of getting better, but it, you know, looking back, it's not like my favorite model. But I would say my two favorite models are uh, the Orc Brave from that Ouroboros pair so i've made like a little diorama for for a guy he commissioned me to paint those and so i made like a swamp that they're sitting there facing off against each other but the brave the one with the the axe you know i did the tattoos in them this was one of the first times i was trying to use glazing to tone skin on a larger scale model and so i learned a lot from that and i just was super happy and he just was so much fun to paint that every time i look back at pictures of that i just remember like how much fun i had painting him so he's definitely one of them and then the the confrontation wolf and prowler that i painted last year um so he's he's like a ninja wolf and he's i did a a koi banner that's sitting behind him on on the display base and i really like him for a couple of reasons one of them is just because i'm really happy with how he turned out i'm really happy with how that banner turned out i've you know, I've always done a lot of freehand stuff, but that was one of the first times I've tried to do actual shading and things on a 2D surface to create the banner. So I was learning a lot in that process, and that was fun. But I also enjoyed it because um, I did that model as part of a painting exchange with a buddy of mine who's a much more novice painter than I am, but he's just started painting, I don't know, maybe 18 months ago. But it's really trying to get better and really trying to push himself, and, and we've become friends and it was one of those, I, what I did was to him, I said, let's make a, let's do an exchange and let's each do something that really pushes our current skill level. And then we can each sort of have that, mo that uh, memento of where that person was at the time and what they were trying to do. And so he sent me an Atlantis miniatures uh, orc where he had tried painting tattoos for the first time on a miniature and he did you know, blood on a weapon and blood was dripping on a snow base. And so yeah, it was really cool, cool to see to him say like, you know, I'm doing something that's hard for me and that scares me a little bit, but I'm going to challenge myself. And then me doing the same thing and, and being able to have that exchange where um, it was just kind of a cool bonding thing for the two of us. So that that's one of the reasons it sticks out to me. So not counting your first, what's your worst? What's the worst model ever? Okay, so there is this one model that sticks out in my mind. Um, it wasn't even painted all that long ago, maybe six years ago. So I, I do some commission painting. You know, people approach me, but I, I'm pretty picky with what I, what I paint. Uh, it has to be a project that actually interests me. It's not my full-time job. So, you know, if somebody comes to me with a model and says, will you paint this? And I look at the model and I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't want to paint that. Um, I'll just turn yeah. it down, you know, yeah, politely, yeah. but I'll just tell I'm not interested. Um, but this one guy, who's he was kind of an acquaintance of mine, and he came to me at the uh, approached me at the game store, and he said, "Would you like to paint this model?" And it was a privateer press model on a horse. It was pretty cool. It's like, yeah, I'll paint that for you. And you know, I gave him a price, and he said, "Okay, yeah, that sounds fine." And you know, I, I'm looking at the model. I'm starting to put it together. I'm getting color scheme in mind. I'm like, oh, it'd be really cool to paint detail like this on him. And then, like about half an hour later, he comes back and says, "Oh, I probably should show you the the rest of my army." 
I go, what? And he puts these he puts these models in front of me that have a paint scheme that I would never choose in a million years. And I'm looking at them, and he's like, "Could you match this paint scheme?" And uh, you know, they they were using metallic paints, they were which is not really something that I use. They were just not my style at all. And so now I have already committed to painting this model. I didn't really want to go back on it, but I wasn't inspired yeah. in the least. So the the final the final model looks okay, but it definitely is not something I was super proud of when I was done and uh, wasn't that fun to, to paint along the way. Yeah, it's funny how that sort of happened. For me, it was a Stormtrooper, where although it's white and black, I'd done scuff and dirt, and most people that look at it say, that's, that's nice, I like what you did there, but there's just something about it for me that just didn't quite work. I mean, it was fine. I didn't want to do a shiny one. That was the, that was the point, but there's just something to me when I look at it I just, it just doesn't work for me. The, the, there's something that I've not got right. To me, it's, I think it's the scuffs because I wanted to scuff his armor. I wanted to show this is a guy that's he's hitting walls, he's hitting trees. He's you know he's he's not worried about how shiny he is. He's there's the thing he needs cover. He's just banged against the tree over time. That's gonna. But the scuffs to me just didn't quite. I think what I had in my head didn't quite translate. But everyone who looks at it goes, yeah. oh, wow, he's not shiny and he looks really good and he's great. But to me, it's like... So they sort of see a success, but I see a failure. Yeah. And I think it's that storm trip for me. is like, I just doesn't... I, I really want to, I want to do it again, but I want to try to work out how, how am I going to... How do I not just replicate what I did the first time? Right. But I think it's good to always be able to look yeah. at your... your mis- not necessarily mistakes, but be able to look at the things and go... Not always be like... You got to not always be like, "Oh, I'm crap," because even those really good guys right. still go, "Oh, I'm crap," and I think that's not always good. But you, yeah. it's good to also not be just going, "Oh, brilliant." Uh, uh, yeah. Well, that, I, I did a post about this. I, I'm trying to remember where I posted it, but I can also send you the pictures for this if you want to show them up on screen. But um, so I just recently painted the Malifaux Showgirls yes. crew yes. for the second edition of Malifaux, and I had painted the first edition crew as well you know, quite a few years ago or not really maybe five or six years ago. And so I did this post where I showed the first edition models that I had painted and was kind of like, when I finished these, I was super proud of them. I, mean, I remember taking them to the game store, showing people, you know, people were like, that's awesome. And, and it was really cool. And I, I was proud and I, I liked how they turned out. But over time, every time I would go back and look at those models, I would start to notice things like, well, the skin is pretty washed out. I don't really have a lot of depth of shadows on the skin. Um, Oh, my, my colors actually were probably a little more pastel. They weren't super, you know, some of the highlights were more pastel, not really realistic. I started thinking about all the ways I would redo them if I painted the yep. squad, the, the crew again. So when second edition came out, I bought the the core box and then uh, I never got around to starting to starting them, but somebody wanted to do a whole Malifaux crew. And I said, well, what about Showgirls? He goes, yeah. So he sent me the models I didn't have. And I did the whole thing at this time taking into consideration all the things I wanted to do differently now that I look back at those. So I think it was it was a great example of you can be proud of something you do, but you can also go back and be critical yep. in the sense of I, I think I can do better if I figure out how to do this. And so part of learning how to shade skin more naturally, how to you know just do some of those detail work, how to bring back in some of that saturation if you start to get to highlights that are too pastel, how do you bring the saturation back? So looking at those models helped to propel me to learn new things so that when I paint something similar, I can make it better than what it was before. Think, so that's... Yeah, of all yeah, your recent ahead. figures, the one that drew me the most that went, holy crap, was the um, Day of the Dead chicky you did. Yeah. I remember mean, when, when you you posted that one up when in the, the stream, because that was the one I was... Ca- and you finished that, and it's like, she's... 28 mil, 32 mil, it's like, <laughs> son of a bitch, you know, because that's the, that's the thing when you're like, I'm really proud of mine, and you look, yeah, because <laughs> that one was, that was really cool, like, the, the, yeah, the makeup that, and the, the, the stuff on the dress, and what's, what's funny about that is, so I bought, talking about Infinity, I bought the, the hack islam bikers like the all basically one copy of all of the bikers and i wanted to just paint up a like a mexican biker gang but basically they would be day of the dead themed um i was going to use the the title of a a song by lord huron called the world ender and so they were going to be the world enders and i was going to paint up this like cool skull 
uh, like Sugar Skull banner. And so one of them was going to have a big banner on the back of his bike, but all of them were going to be painted up with Day of the Dead makeup. Their bikes were going to have Sugar Skulls on them and lots of flowers. And it was just kind of be this, like, this theme. And I've got all the models put together. They're all primed and I just never got around to, to working on them. So then when I was working on those Malifaux miniatures and just thinking, like looking at that particular model, she looks like she's dressed in that kind of, you know, traditional, um, uh, like Mexican yeah, day yeah. of the dead type, like that dress just screamed like this feels, feels like she's from this, this type of world. So, um, yeah, it was really fun to, to at least try out that color scheme and that paint scheme on a model, see if I could even pull it off. <laughs> that was impressive. I, I really did like that one. So what do you, you want to improve most? Being a golden demon winner, most people are going to go, well, doesn't need to improve anything. Yeah, that was but... a long time ago. That was back when that was back when it was the best painters among the gamers who would win. <laughs> and now it's like the best painters in the world for, from just anything. You know, the, the hobby has grown. And I think it's the quality of the models has reached a, a point where the best artists in the world look at the miniatures and go, those would be something that would yeah. be fun to paint. I also think just nerd culture as a whole is more much more accepted. And so people are more looking into to this yeah. type of hobby. So, you know, I, I don't, I'm not too precious about those awards. <laughs> I don't go around like, you know, like you're carrying them around with me into stores. Like, Hey guys, do you know who I am? I, I've got these, these golden demons. So, but you know, the, there's always things that you can improve. Um, so let me think. One of the things that I've never really done is I've never done much weathering mm. on models. My, my work has always been much more focused on clean, you know, nice paint jobs. It just, you know, colors are blended really well, highlighted really well. Everything's clean, beautiful. But that weathering is something that's always impressed me when people do it. And I just really don't know how to do it. I've never tried. So it's kind of on my to-do list in the near future to start bringing some of that in. So I'm going to use on Ali, the miniature I'm working on now, I'm going to start using yep. weathering pigments yep. for the first time to bring in some dust on her boots and just, just dip my toe in, in getting into that realm. And then um, in the sometime in the next year or so, I want to work on a model that I'm going to weather and just try yeah, it and that's, learn. That's for me, um, I guess coming from the military side of things, I'm, I'm lucky that way that Spitfires were never clean. I mean, they might've been clean for yeah. a very short period of time, but they, they were, they, and they took off from grass fields. So they was mud gets thrown up from the wheels and the under and they leaked oil. And that was yeah. just the nature of that, that particular beast. So I think coming from a military background was lucky for me in that way that weathering is a part of that pro every single process when you do that yeah. and soldiers, mud trenches. So I end up painting mm -hmm. a lot of my figures with some form of, weathering and, and scuffing and when I did the Stormtrooper I did the same reason I didn't want to do this just shiny Stormtrooper I like no they're meant to be elite troops these guys fight they, uh -huh. they they have mud on their boots they have scuffs on their armor I do have the Scout Trooper with his bike and that's what I'm going to do the bike's going to get all chips and, and that yeah. and I'm going to do the same with him I'm trying to just work out how I want to do him but he's not going to be this bright shiny white Scout Trooper he's going to have stuff on him and it definitely is a different style of um figure but I, I like that too about miniature painting because we could take the same figure at night and i could paint him shiny and then gloss him like a he's a royal palace guard or something on duty and then you can take the same guy and go he used to be a palace guard but the king got murdered yeah. and he's like shame and he went into the wilderness and he's now that old grizzled warrior his arm is as tarnished as he he felt like one of the best movies yeah. for that was uh, excalibur yeah, yeah, they had that massive yeah. shiny armor for ninety percent of the film. But when they did the quest for the Grail, as they started to lose their their faith in in finding it, their armor became tarnished yeah. based on them. And the armor was the same armor, but it was rusted and blackened. And so you can take those same figures, yeah. and the, no two ever has to be the same. Even if it's exactly the same figure, you can paint them in vastly different ways. But yeah, I, I think weathering is a really cool thing. The weathering powders are great. Uh, getting the buggers to stay on. That that could be fun. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm looking forward to to failing and trying. Well, new there is a uh, like the MIG <laughs> one. I use the MIG powders, and they uh -huh. have a setting solution. But the mm -hmm. the problem with it is sometimes it'll dry, but it will dry more like a wet 
compound, which is fine if what you wanted okay. was sort of more that sort of dryish mud. But if you wanted it just completely dry, then it, it's it's a bit harder because it also will have a set demarcation line where that where that okay. seal, solution ends. That's where the the sealing of the powders would end. So it's, it's sometimes right. hard to get that blend in to not lose it. And if you don't do that, you get a really good look. But anyone who touches it, just, if it's just sitting on top, you'll just rub it off. It just rubs so, right off. Yeah. So what's the best? So what's the best advice for for creating dusty boots and getting them to look? Uh... I, I do it if it's if it's small. I'll just do mixes of brown paint, or okay. I might I might use the powder and wet it. Um, okay. Because what it'll do then is I'll get it on there, dab it, so it's not uniform. Because obviously you, that's what you don't want. You don't want mud to look uniform, right. and just sort of speckle it on, or flick it. That's one of my fa- that's one of my okay. favorites. My absolute favorite, if it's a big enough figure, is to get like the use the, the powder, get it wet, either use water or um, a varnish, put a few drops of varnish in it, and flick it. You won't have control, obviously, but you'll get that splatter effect, and okay. I, I like doing that. Um, the other thing with that solution is a lot of people use a lot of it. I'll use tiny bits, and what I'll so I'll put all the the dust on where I want, and then I'll almost dry brush like i'll get all the as much of the solution off the brush as possible and then just sort of dab it and just try to get a thin coat because it'll it'll seal over the stuff because obviously if there's too much and it runs you're going to pull the your powders from where you put them and it'll come down that makes sense so you i just just little bits and just try to get it just really gentle it takes a while but i'm trying not to lift up the powder because it's wet that's the thing the solution is wet so just get a little so it wants to lift and then just let it sort of seal and um over a gloss coat can be good too because it will stop that coffee stain because the solution will still react if it's a matte coat you'll get that water uh, I don't know if you've ever okay. had that where you've if you've had a matte coat and then uh-huh. you put a, another thing over or if you put a water wash or something and you've, every now and again you go oh crap what's that line it's like that's where the the wash line's been on the mat so sometimes the, my last thing before doing the powders will be gloss coat let it let completely dry put on the powders because then you won't get any of that sort of water line stuff okay and then can you do a matte yep. varnish coat over oh, the yeah. top of the... Oh, yeah. once, okay. it's all, once it's all okay. sealed, I try not to ever do it dripping. I mean, I've seen some people do it where you can... <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? But yeah. I'll do like... If, I, if I've done like the powders, I'll do like really thin. Just go... Done. Let it sit. Let it dry completely. And then same... Again, let it sit dry. And then sort of build that varnish up just in case. Because they say it won't, but I don't always trust what manufacturers say only because they don't know what varnish I'm using like I use exactly I use the Craylon a lot I get this from Michaels uh-huh. for five bucks and it's not never affected a mini in a bad way yet but they don't know if I'm using this or if I'm using theirs or whatever so if this reacts right. it might not react just doing a light coat but if you do like a normal okay I'm sealing it all in done if that reacts with the sealant then you know you, you suddenly go what's all my pigments gone so yeah. I do if I've done the pigments like that I'll just go like psst, psst put it over let it dry then come back pst, same let it dry till i think yeah okay there's enough coat and then if i want to do one matte coat at the end to just bring her all down okay that's good advice what would you like to see companies do less or improve upon as a just general sort of thing Ooh. Minus less kickstarters yeah i yeah, I'd like to see that too. Um, not just hmm. because for me, it's not just the fact that there's always something, and you're trying to like work out where do you want to spend your money, and there's things you you know there's always different minis coming out in that, but it's it's not just yeah. that. But they've moved from just going here's here's a new figure, here's a new monthly release to we're going to do three a year, and we're going to do these big things, and we're going to use it as pre-orders, right. and it's just feeling a little bit. For me, like it's getting a little bit out of control. With it's like they're not just yeah. releasing stuff. It's not just their whole business model is now moving from just being about the figures to being about how the figures are going to be on Kickstarter. Right. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I I could certainly answer differently depending on whether we're talking about like what they should do with their games versus what they should do with model releases and things like that. But um, yeah, that's a good question. I haven't really I. I kind of feel, I mean, my position on that is that because there are so many people making miniatures now that 
I'm I'm not I'm not struggling to find something I want to paint. So if you know if if a company made one cool model but the other stuff yeah. isn't very cool and I buy that one cool model, great. I don't really care what they're doing with the rest of their line. It doesn't it doesn't affect me in any way because I got them one model that I want to paint. So I tend to not really think too much about that. I, I, I think I, I don't really necessarily have a great answer for that. Not a problem. And do you paint one or many at a time? I tend to have a whole bunch on the go, which I really don't want. I want to work on just one. I want to focus yeah. story, concept, paint, just this. But I end up having to be like, I do this, let it dry, but I'll do this while that dry, and then I'll do this yeah. while that dries, and I'll do this, and I can go back to this one. And I'm always jumping around. I've got about 30 on the go at the moment where I, I really just want one, but it doesn't seem to work for me. Right. I The answer kind of depends on what I'm trying to achieve. So... Like back when I would have my Troll Bloods army and I'd be working on something, if it was a unit of 10 guys, I would probably work on five at a time. I mean, that's about the most I can work on it without getting into that assembly line mode where my quality drops because I, yeah. I get so bored <laughs> with what I'm doing. So about five is the max. Um, typically, it's one to two at a time, but again, it kind of depends on what's going on. Like with the, the Malifo show girls I was doing, I would do anywhere from two to four at a time, just kind of depending on what they might have in common that I can do some, you know, mix up one, one color of Brown, for example, and it would work for different parts of four different miniatures or something like that. So I, I definitely like to keep my, my model count really low of what I'm working on at any given time and really focus on that piece because you know, I want to. I want to be focused on it. I want to put the detail and the effort I want to go into it. I don't want to worry about like trying to juggle too many yeah. things at one time. I like and at to, the moment. I like to stay mine focused. ninety percent twenty-eight mil, which I'm trying to finish them yeah. off because I've got several larger ones. But you've been working on more larger ones recently, like Alley, which mm -hmm. is a different ball yeah. game completely to working on the smaller ones. Yeah, absolutely. And she's been fun because I just committed to. I'm going to paint her only on stream. You know, other than just maybe cleaning up a couple things off camera, but like, you know, I'm not going to hide any part of the process. So she's been fun that I'm painting along with everything else that I'm working on. It's just, okay, it's Sunday afternoon. Like, let's pull you out, Allie yeah. out again, put two more hours of work into her and put her away till next week. And that, that's that been fun and, and different. Uh, I've never really done something like that I before. I love that figure. The only thing with her, she needs to swap hands with the guns. Yeah, yeah. You, you said that that the, yeah, the injection the ports are going to be go, yeah. If she swapped shoot, hands, it'd be going in, away from her. But that's the only thing. When I look at it, oh, that's yep. funny. And I'm not blaming. It's still a cool figure. But I just looked at it and went like, right. that's interesting because she'd she go to yeah. the dead wheel. They'd be flat in front of her face. <laughs> yeah, that's funny because well, maybe that's cool. Maybe that's more cinematic. You know? Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> for those close-up shots, you got to have the shells flying through the air. And the last question was: Is there any? actual mini that you're really excited for that's coming out um let's think here so i will say the uh durgan forge i believe is what the the name of it is they did a kickstarter last year and so those models are going to be coming out pretty soon so they're another type of dwarf they have much more of an animation style to them but also really really highly characterful minis and so I'm really looking forward to seeing those in person and seeing like if you know how how well the character of the renders is is actually translated into the model because I think it'd be really fun to to paint a few of those after painting the Atlantis miniatures and just kind of seeing what what they bring out of me that is different from what the Atlantis yeah. miniatures are bringing out of me because I'm I'm they just kind of call for a little bit different you can do diff uh, different claims finish so. style yeah yeah. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to those coming out. I think they're going to be a lot of fun. And they just started showing their some renders for the humans that they're making for their world. They're not going to come out for a while, but they're really interesting and different too. And you know, that's something that really draws me to to new miniatures. Is it's got to be something that that's just kind of different from what I've seen before. You know, I mean, how many different times have you seen the same type yeah. of model just represented? slightly different poses by different companies but i really appreciate when a model, when somebody's coming up with something really clever and new that just it carries a story with it and it's something that just makes you want yeah, to paint it in the last year especially like 2017 i noticed a lot more miniatures that before i hadn't that were starting to go like oh this is interesting from like Orboros yeah. and raging heroes i mean they've been around a long time but it's been like the last year i started looking at them going like no that's interesting and then 
a lot of those smaller companies like Atlantis and that that came out and they weren't doing the same as everyone else. It wasn't just, yeah, there's more generic dwarves or generic orcs, which we, so many companies did orcs and all the time they were standard just like, it wasn't necessarily no imagination, but it was almost like they were always pulling on what was there before. Whereas the last yeah. year we started to see a lot more stuff that's like, I've got an idea. Here's what I do for goblins. And it's not what we'd seen before. And it's still very goblin. And that's why I like Zayna. She's definitely a goblin when you look at it, but at the same time, she's not. And that's what's interesting about that figure and why I I got pulled to it was for that reason. It's like, okay, that's interesting because, and that's the thing, like the the Etten and that, I mean, I saw that one Mm. and the trolls even. They're definitely trolls, but they're not standard trolls. They're not the trolls that came before. They're sort of, if you put it on the table, no one's going to go, oh, that's not a troll. They're going to go, trolls, but they've got that, that new element to them. That, yeah. And then you did the blue, which yep. was a really interesting idea with the spots. Uh, I love that one too. I think yeah, that was thanks. actually maybe the first figure of yours I saw. I think it was okay. that, that troll. Yeah, that that was a fun one. I, yeah, I was trying some new things with that. I, I donated that one to the Nova Open charity raffle. And so um, what's funny is the guy who won the raffle for that model was the guy who... Uh, commissioned me to paint the Ouroboros orcs. <laughs> well, that's cool. So he yeah. ended up, you know, just keep it yeah, in the family. Cool. Yeah, you know, he collect more of my models. So he was super happy to win that. That well, was funny. Awesome. That's all we had for you. So I want to. Th- all right. Thanks, man. It was really a pleasure to talk to you, Aaron, and um, look forward to and talking I'll to you put again. All your links to Twitter and Facebook and everything that you you want will be in the description, so everyone can right. follow you there. So if Appreciate you know, you should. If any, because all you know, all, all your mini painters that, that watch my stuff, you should totally go and check out Alan. And I'll, I'll put your uh, the eye uh, tutorial one there for sure. And so yeah, Thanks. go check him out. That's partly why we did this. So totally appreciate you taking the time to do it. Cool. Thank you, muchly, sir.